Hi, welcome back to PC Builder. I'm Jason. This is the June Q&A, and you guys asked some amazing questions, including, yes, NVIDIA finally cut GPU prices on RTX 3000 and 4000 series GPUs, but their new commitment to AI, does this mean gamers can expect higher GPU prices? We'll also talk about what you should be spending in 2023 for 1080p, 1440p, and 4K, given the amount of VRAM on these GPUs. DDR4 versus DDR5, are CPUs too powerful, and tons of other great questions coming right up. Remember, if you get value out of the video, give it a like so it makes a huge difference to the channel. And of course, subscribe and click that bell icon. That way you get notified when we release cool content. With that, let's jump into it. This video is sponsored by Squarespace, giving you a powerful online platform to create your own website. It's easy to get started with Squarespace's professional website templates with designs for every category and use case. Then simply customize your look, update content and add features to fit your needs. Sell your products online from services to physical and even digital products. And Squarespace makes checkout seamless for your customers using credit cards, Apple Pay, PayPal, and more. Visit squarespace.com slash PC Builder to sign up for a free trial and get 10% off your first purchase. We've got tons of questions about what else the GPU market. Let's start with this one by Holy Crusader. Do I think GPU prices are getting too high for what they're worth? Or do I think the advancements merit the rapid increase of price? Well, honestly, the rapid increase of price has nothing to do with the advancements. Jensen wants to get up there and say, oh, Moore's Law is dead. What, a year or two ago when the 40 series was announced, basically trying to justify the price. And now he just got on the stage at CES saying, oh no, Moore's Law is actually going two times what it was before. It's like, pick a lane, Jensen. You got to pick a lane. Like a lot of companies out there, they're always just looking to justify whatever they're doing right now. Look at the RTX 4060 Ti that just came out. The RX 7600 came out as well. NVIDIA basically says, oh no, the 4060 Ti I always meant to make that a 1080p GPU with eight gigabytes of for $400, 1080p in 2023 for $400. No, maybe in 2013, probably a slightly outrageous price even then. 3080, 10 gigabyte came out for $599 in 2020. Now they want to double the price to the 4080 and they're only going to give you six more gigs of VRAM, by the way. Oh yeah, by the way, only six more gigs of VRAM. Absolutely insane. And as a result, we've seen these launches, the 4070 Ti, the 4080, the 4070, and now the 4060 Ti. 8 gigabyte completely flop and nobody is buying this nonsense out there. Look, some people have to buy GPUs because their GPU died or they're a professional and they're doing work and they need NVIDIA for their work. I get it that those folks are going out there. Right now, the real deals are on last generation AMD GPUs and NVIDIA is in a big pickle right now with this whole we don't have enough VRAM. They don't have enough VRAM on their cards. Their cards not only are overpriced for the rasterization performance that they're giving, their cards are massively overpriced for the longevity of those GPUs given how little VRAM they have. So yes, GPU prices are not justified by current valuation. They're basically being justified by Nvidia's greed trying to artificially keep the market where it was when crypto miners were out there buying hundreds of GPUs in a go for any price they could get because they were printing money. And that's just no longer the case anymore. We will see in the future whether or not NVIDIA is actually going to win this war. I actually think they're losing this war, but it's going to take a little while longer to finally see all of those prices come down. Though we did just see huge NVIDIA price cuts on the RTX 3000 series, even some 4000 series cards. So I think their whole we never get price cuts nonsense is starting to crack. All right, we got some great follow-up questions. Son of Ulti and Dylan Jassel. Basically, hey, Jason, okay, those GPUs, the prices aren't justified. What would be a justified price for them? 4070, 4070 Ti, 4080, XT. And what should we be paying in 2023 for 1080p, for 1440p, and 4K? Great news is we have our best GPU for gaming uh, video out. You should check that out. We do go through all the cards right now, what good values are out there. But what would, in a nutshell, what would I do if I was suddenly the CEO of NVIDIA and I could just wave a magic wand and change prices? I think the 4080 should be at least smashed down a tier. So it should be at least that all the GPUs get smashed down a tier. So 4080 becomes a 4070 Ti pricing, goes down to $800 instead of 1200. 4070 Ti goes to 4070 pricing. 4070 pricing goes down to the 4060 Ti pricing. The problem is, even that wouldn't help because of the amount of VRAM. NVIDIA has made a huge mistake with their VRAM uh, allotments on these GPUs. I think that we're going to see relatively soon refreshes of some of these GPUs where they're all going to get 16 gigs basically or more. I think 12 gigs is relatively safe for 1440p, at least for a while. Uh, it's certainly very safe for 1080p. And I don't think you can charge more than $400 for those cards. $400. And anything with 8 gigs of VRAM 
It's a $250 cheaper card. I don't care that 4060 Ti is faster than the 6700 XT. It's got eight gigs of VRAM. It bottlenecks and then it looks like garbage where the 6700 XT looks phenomenal in these same games because it's got 12 gigs of VRAM. Even though rasterization, if you put it in a lesser title like CSGO, yeah, the 4060 Ti will give you more frames, but who cares? It means that you can't play certain games at ultra settings at 1080p. What are we, we're going backwards now. What are these 720p cards then? I mean, literally, are these 720p cards? So that's how I'm thinking about it right now. I think you got to focus on the amount of VRAM in 2023. And to me, 10 gigs is a 1080p card and I'd pay about, yeah, about $300 at most for those. 12 gigs is 1440p, at least for the foreseeable future. And I'd pay up to maybe $400. And then anything else over that has to have 16 gigs of VRAM or it's just not a viable GPU. KNG asked a great question, knowing that Nvidia just cut prices hugely on their GPUs. Yes, right, the 3060 12 gigabyte right now going for about $280. That's down from about $350, $360 where that thing has sat for a long time. Is Nvidia now winning on mid-range budget GPU side? Well, if you just look under $300 and you just kind of put blinders on, wow, that 3060 looks like a great value even though the 6650 XT is faster and it's got two more gigs of VRAM than the 6700 non-XT. The problem is that the 6700 XT just got another price cut to day as I'm filming this, it's now down to almost $300. So it's only about 20 bucks more than the 3060 and it's way faster and it's got uh, the same 12 gigs of VRAM and it's just way, way faster GPU. So yeah, I, I think the 3060 needs to continue to come down in price, not because of the amount of VRAM on it, but because of the rasterization performance and because of the competition from AMD's RX 6700 XT. Hopefully we don't run out of 6700 XTs soon because that card, that card has been an absolute gem in this generation in terms of price to performance. El Vato Loco asks a phenomenal question here. What about NVIDIA's strategic direction of underpinning AI rather than focusing on gaming? Is this a bad thing and how is this gonna affect everybody in the market? Now, whether you like AI or you hate it, you think it's gonna destroy the world or not destroy the world, it's happening. The boom is happening right now. Companies are buying tons and tons of GPUs at the data center level. Now, these GPUs are not like the GPUs that you and I buy for gaming. They're souped up. They've got tons and tons of VRAM, like huge amounts of VRAM. And they're often kind of paired together with other things. NVIDIA just gave a whole keynote about them at Computex. You could check that out if you're really, really interested. But how does this impact gamers? Well, number one, it allows NVIDIA to largely ignore gamers. Despite the fact that their gaming revenues were way down, their stock price is way up. And that all has to do with how people are valuing the potential upside of their AI market. So in that respect, yeah, unfortunately, it's allowing NVIDIA to ignore gamers right now and not have to cut the prices. That's unfortunate. Could we get into a situation where there's not enough silicon production available and they have to make choices? They're obviously gonna choose the high margin AI stuff if it's still going really, really strong. That is a potential threat. All that being said, I don't know. We are expanding silicon production right now. There's gonna be new chip factories that come online in the US in the next couple of years. But right now it is allowing Nvidia to somewhat ignore gamers in terms of the pricing of their GPUs. Rogue Demon asks a great question. What about brand? Does it matter when you buy a motherboard, a GPU, Asus, MSI, Gigabyte, ASRock, all these? Well, for GPUs, check out our best GPU for gaming video. I actually go into that in quite some detail. Let's talk about PC components in general there. It's really interesting. It depends on what we're talking about. To me, I found that brand essentially doesn't matter. What matters is the chipset of motherboard you're buying. Sometimes the motherboard manufacturers do great. Gigabyte knocked it out of the park with their B550 AM4 motherboards. Absolutely knocked it out of the park, but they were coming off a generation B450. They were terrible. Their motherboards were terrible and they were responding to the bad response to their B450 motherboards and designing much better B550 motherboards. So oftentimes brands that get punched in the face by consumers will come back the very next generation of whatever motherboards or GPUs, and they'll do a way better job. Look at ASRock. They got punched in the face over their VRMs, rightly so too. They responded terribly, by the way, but they came back with phenomenal B550 motherboards. Unfortunately for them, they didn't have BIOS flashback on a major oversight, whoops. And they learned from that too. And all their AM5 motherboards they did a great job. I think they did a great job on their AM5 motherboards. And look at ASUS. ASUS is the premium brand. And as soon as there was a problem with their Ryzen 7000 motherboards, with their AM5 motherboards, what'd they do? They basically threw up the smoke screen 
campaign and they did everything that supposedly crappy brands do and they were crappy too, even though that, that's the premium brand and they consistently demand a price premium for it. Yes, they did eventually get to a good place. In fact, paradoxically, again, here's the brand getting punched in the face by consumers actually turning out to do a good job. Now, if you look, their warranty statements in terms of what they'll support in terms of XMP and Expo memory profiles, overclocking with Precision Bruce Overdrive and others, they now exceed everybody else's. So they went from the worst to the best in terms of saying what they would support in terms of their warranty. To me, it's less about brand. I just focus on what brand is doing a great job. And this is why I think individual reviews and individual models are so important as opposed to, oh, I'm just gonna buy from brand X. Got an interesting question from Tristan here about GPU quo on heavily upvoted. Is it just something we have to accept? Is it norm now? Should you return a GPU until you get one that will not squeal during high FPS scenarios? Man, coil wine is something and has just confounded PC builders since the beginning of time, really, since the beginning, since the stone age of PC building. And it has to do with power usage and high, particularly higher levels of power usage when the power gets transformed. I, we don't need to go into all that. It's just an annoying noise that happens, right? Especially when things are under load. And you can have two GPUs of the same make, manufacture everything, model number, and one of them is noisy and one of them not as noisy because of coil wine just because it comes down to very, very small manufacturing changes or manufacturing differences between them and tolerances between them. Honestly, I don't know what to tell you about coil wine. That's to me is why you buy a nice quality case you know, so the, you get the coil wine down to something that's manageable once the case is all closed up in it. I will say that if it's excessive, then I would consider returning your GPU, uh, swap it out for another model. Hope you kind of get a little bit luckier next time. We recently had the Aorus 7900 XTX. Initially, the coil wine on that uh, was not great, but once we put it all in the case, close the case up, I couldn't hear it anymore. I'd try and use it for at least a little while, but if, if it's too loud and it is annoying, then definitely return it. Kirby Louise asks a great question about, hey, are Ryzen 9 and Core i9 becoming largely irrelevant and just for synthetic benchmarks? given how powerful like just basically eight core CPUs have become. It's interesting if you look, for instance, at the 3950X, remember that CPU, the Ryzen 9 3950X, it was the first 16 core CPU, 32 threads were like, oh my God, this thing, crazy powerful. Well, you can get that power in an i5-13600K right now. That's right, an i5-13600K will outperform the 3950X. The CPUs have more instructions per clock, they run at higher frequencies, and they're just way more performative on a per core basis than those older CPUs. So yeah, I mean, imagine a couple of years ago, if you built a 3950X system with a 2080 Ti and that was your workstation, you were like, this is the best workstation on the planet outside of Threadripper. So if you now can put something together that's even better than that for a lot less money, do you really need a 3900K? It gets down to like video editing, for instance. Yeah, you can run these synthetics where it basically has a script and it does all this stuff really fast. No human being can video edit that fast, no human being. So maybe there's some things you can do like the playback score and others, the encoding score, where yeah, you kind of set it and forget it or you're doing a, a slide across and you want to get more frames. But in terms of like making all these really quick edits, I like the Puget Bench test and their benchmark, but you do have to ask yourself, is editing on a 13600K any different than editing on a 13900K? I really don't think so. And that's why I do wonder sometimes, like the 7950X, you really need something that can use all those cores at once without having to really interact with you because more often than not, you are the limit. The user becomes the limiting factor, not the speed of the CPU. Got some great questions about DDR4 versus DDR5. Jack Pellon asked, hey, I remember about a year ago, tech experts like yourself were saying DDR5 was unstable. Well, I never said it was unstable or not worth the price. Price, that was what I said compared to DDR4 at the time. Would I say that that's fully changed now? Is DDR5 the go-to when making a build going forward? I would say DDR5 now, right now as I'm filming this, is price competitive to the point where I would use it over DDR4 at the mid range and higher end builds absolutely hands down, especially with something like a 13600K, 13700K, you can get relatively affordable 6400 CL32 RAM, which is what most of the benchmarks use, good price. 
the super high-end stuff, like the 7400, I think it is, CL34, that's still stupidly expensive, like $180, $190. Why wouldn't you just go from the 13600K to the 13700K instead? And that, that'll give you the performance difference rather than spending all that money on, on that memory. I would say at the budget end, DDR4 still makes a lot of sense because the CPUs that use DDR4 still make a lot of sense, like the i3-12100F, the 13100F, and the Ryzen 5600, along with the 12400F and 13 400F. Those are increasingly the budget tier CPUs that you should be looking at. If you're looking at budget tier CPUs with a budget tier GPU, then spending that extra money on DDR5 isn't going to get you, net you any additional performance. You just take that extra money, you pump it into a bigger GPU, that's going to get you the performance. Until DDR4 and DDR5 reach price parity, which we're still quite a ways away from at the low end, I think that'll continue to be the, the case. Well, let's jump into the speed round. We've got El Drifto saying, people say two by eight gigabyte DDR5 kits are much worse performance in gaming. Is this true? No, absolutely not. We've tested this. Two by eight gigabyte kits perform exactly the same as the two by 16 gigabyte kits regardless of whatever small differences there are in architecture. And I will say this though, it was the case when DDR5 initially came out that the two by eight gigabyte kits were about half the price of the 32 gigabyte kits, but that's no longer the case for most of the mainstream kits. It's not only about a $10 difference. So I'm basically saying, unless you're getting a stupidly good price on two by eight gigabytes, go ahead and buy the 32 gigabyte kit for like 10 bucks more. Sellout artist has what's going on with PSU prices. Basically, why are they so expensive? PSUs, for those who don't track this stuff, you could get like a C tier rated PSU uh, a year or two ago for about $30, $30. And that's generally where they've kind of sat. Today, it's like almost $70 for the same level of PSU performance in terms of the PSU cultist list. If you haven't checked out our best PSU buying guide, I'll leave a link to it down in the video description. Basically what's going on, I think this has to do with the transition to the ATX 3.0, the new power connectors, the PCIe 5 power connectors on them. And what we're seeing is just certain units are not being produced in the volume that they were. The other thing is uh, because tech was in a, a temporary slump. There was an overproduction of these for a long time. They're selling through a lot of these units and it's not like there's tons waiting behind them and they had cut prices in order to move them. But now that's not the case as much. So I just think we're in a little bit of a transition time in the PSU market. Will prices ever get back to that like 25 or $30 for a decent PSU? I don't know, but I hopefully they do come down from where they're at right now. All right, CJS and Last Gaming GT basically ask very complimentary questions, which we get all the time. How long is AM4 gonna last? How long is AM5 going to last? And I think when people ask this question, what they really mean is, Jason, if I build a system that's a Ryzen 7600 right now, or Ryzen 5600 right now, or honestly an i5-12400 right now, will that system continue to give me performance or is it gonna kind of mythically degrade? Okay, the system that you build today is, should give you the same performance five years from now. It's just that that performance five years in, from now, games and other things might want more performance than their platform is providing. So the question of whether or not the system you build today is gonna give you the same performance should be answered. Don't worry that 5600 gaming system, budget system you put together today can be absolutely fine. But if you can step up to the 7600 with a good graphics card on it, yes, you will be able to drop in a 8600 or 9600 or whatever they call Zen 5, possibly even Zen 6. AMD's proposed to support that or promised to support, I should say, through 2025 plus. I have no idea what that means. I don't think they know what that means, to be honest. So don't worry if you build these PCs today, they'll give you the same level of performance five years from now that they do now, minus your bloatware. But if you want something that's future upgradable, Ryzen 7000 AM5 is really the only game in town. Check out the link to our sponsor, Squarespace, for a free trial and 10% off your first purchase. Remember, if you got value out of the video, please give it a like as it makes a huge difference to the channel. And of course, subscribe and click that bell icon. That way you get notified when we release cool content. There's a great new way to support the channel. We're launching channel memberships and you can be part of it. You'll get cool emojis that you can use in the video comments, early access to behind the scenes content and exclusive live stream events for members. Click the join button below the video to check out everything and help support the channel. Thank you so much for your support and we'll catch you on the next one.